All right, I guess we can get started. We're ready to talk about infrastructure as code. All right, so I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, I'm Keith. I'm a consultant at ThoughtWorks. Um, we tend to help companies with delivering software and finding ways to get better at delivering software. Um, my role within that is has traditionally, when I started seven years ago, is around engaging with operations teams um, to help with that. If we're going to do continuous delivery, um, what do we need to do to get into production and make that path smooth, right? So we, we, we typically start with kind of the development side of the organization. We're trying to bring the operations side um, into that. And then over time, um, because um, cloud and infrastructure automation has become more and more popular, um, more organizations are looking um, at how to, and more people and teams who are using these tools are looking at ways to, to use them better, basically. Um, in my background, I've been uh, working in IT for over 20 years across systems administration and development roles. I've always been into automating infrastructure. How many people here uh, worked with a tool called CF Engine or aware of CF Engine? Um, Hey, one, one person. Um, so this is the predecessor to like uh, Puppet and, and Chef and Ansible and these kind of tools. And so this was like one of the first tools that I adopted. Well, I first started out with like um, shell scripts and Perl and those kind of things to automate uh, things on physical servers. And then over time, um, I discovered CF Engine and messed around with that. And then Puppet came out in Chef. And so I've always kind of been interested in this space. As someone who's crossed development and operations before, that was a, a thing with a, 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 a label. Um, that's always been kind of like a natural thing for me to do. So um, I, I wrote this book, Infrastructure as Code, um, basically to kind of capture. So this is, you know, the, the term had been around since about 2006, around the time that the term DevOps came out. Some of the, the same people um, kind of coined the term. It's a bit murky as to who actually came up with it, but um, it kind of emerged um, in those days. Um, it's been a good handy label for it. So I try to kind of capture patterns and practices uh, for implementing automation um, with this book, basically things that I've been talking with people about um, how to do. So um, today I'm going to talk about, so how many people were, saw my talk yesterday? Um, a few people. So there's some, a, a couple of the, um, the, the slides are similar, because I'm kind of starting from a similar point, um, like setting the context of, you know, what is it that, what are the kind of pressures and, and forces in the industry that are affecting kind of our organizations um, and leading to the adoption of, of uh, infrastructure automation tools in cloud. Um, whereas yesterday I focused on um, a bit more on the kind of governance and change management and what it means at that level. Today I'm going to focus a little bit more on the engineering practices part of it. So, you know, the kind of the, 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 the key driver um, is around being faster, you know, faster to market, faster to kind of try out new ideas and improve, you know, release um, continuous improvements to infrastructure and to systems as a whole. Um, and so this has been, this is kind of an overall pressure that we're getting a lot of these days. And so cloud is kind of a, a means um, to help with that, right? So, so moving away from having to provision infrastructure, you know, by hand and, and taking quite a long time to saying we can do it automatically. Um, and I use cloud as kind of a, a hook to also talk about infrastructure automation, even if it's not literally cloud, but it's all this kind of stuff of making our infrastructure more flexible. Um, but of course, if we go faster, we have to think about the risks that are involved. So just because we can let people spin up servers for themselves and, and do all the things for themselves very easily and quickly, um, that doesn't mean that kind of the, um, you know, problems go away of, you know, we have to make sure that we're doing things correctly. We have to make sure that we're not going to break something. Um, and so how do we manage that at speed, at pace? And so one of the, one of the themes, and again, I talked about this yesterday, um, is the idea that uh, we traditionally think of having to trade off between going quickly or doing things properly, that there's, you know, you have to either choose one side or the other to kind of lean towards. Um, and so the state of the DevOps report, um, it's something that comes out every year, and I, I highly recommend having a look at it, especially if you're in a position where you're having conversations within your organization with kind of stakeholders of people who, uh, you know, executives and so on, management, around why should we be doing DevOps, why should we be doing continuous delivery in more agile ways. Um, because it, it has research um, into real companies and, and what their kind of practices are around agile and lean and all these kind of things, and then what the results are, so how effective they are. And one of the um, things which, which comes out of this report, a, a really strong theme, is that companies which are the most effective, that is the companies who have fewer failures when they try to release software, 
um, who spend, whose, whose staff spend least amount of time, you know, fixing things in a remediation activities. And even the companies who are the most successful in terms of, you know, commercially, um, are the companies who are releasing software more frequently and releasing changes more frequently, right? So that's, that's kind of counterintuitive because it means that the faster you go, um, the more reliable, you know, things are, the better results you get. And I think it sounds counterintuitive at first, but I think the reasons for this, there's a couple of reasons. And, um, it's basically because, you know, in order to go quickly, you have to be good at it, right? So if your processes are, are really difficult and unwieldy, um, and, you know, lots of manual steps and things that go wrong, you can't go quickly, right? So in order to be, you know, moving at speed, you have to get good processes and, and get good at making changes um, without making mistakes. Um, it also forces us to manage technical debt because technical debt slows you down. And so in order to, to be able to, again, to make changes very frequently, even if at the pace of, say, weekly, much less daily or a couple of times a day, um, you can't have systems which are very flaky, um, and where you're, you know, it's, it's really hard to change things. You have to have systems where the design and the implementation is, is very clean and easy to change and easy to understand when things go wrong. And also the, 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 the broken windows thing I think is important. So there's this phrase of broken windows, um, which came from kind of a law enforcement campaign in New York where, um, the mayor was trying to kind of clean up the city and, and, and improve kind of the, the state of things. And, um, the theory is that, um, by fixing the small things helps improve the overall culture. Um, and so if you see something, for example, if you see something wrong in your system and you think, okay, it's not broken, it, it kind of works, but it's a little bit dodgy um, and, you know, it could, something could break in the future. If correcting that, improving that takes like multiple weeks, it means you have to like justify it and go to a cab meeting and, and have lots of process around that, you won't fix it, right? You'll put it on the list of known issues and you say, well, maybe we'll get to it later and it'll just get fixed at some point. And that list builds up. And then you have this kind of culture where it's acceptable to have dodgy code and, and systems. Uh, by lowering the barrier and saying, we've got the processes in place, we're getting good at change, and we're able to say that thing that looks a little bit dodgy, we can just fix it and, and be confident that it's not going to break something to fix it. You know, we're, we're, we're confident in making changes. Um, that just kind of improves the overall quality of the system. So it kind of makes sense when you look at those organizations who are, doing, who are, who are very, very good at IT, um, that this is the approach. They're making changes constantly because that's how you fix and improve and learn is by making changes. All right. So what good looks like overall, what we kind of want to get to is where we can have multiple teams working on our system, on a complex system, potentially with many uh, moving parts, um, but we are minimizing the overhead of coordinating changes between those teams. We don't have to spend a lot of time talking about what changes we're making. Um, and that changes are a routine thing that happen easily. Um, and also that we can rebuild anything at any time. So any part of our infrastructure, we're very confident that, you know, if something happens to it or you know, whatever it is, we can just, you know, it, it, it's not flaky. It's not something we have to be very, very careful. Don't touch it. It might break. So when I first discovered virtualization, so I used to work with, with physical servers. And when somebody came to me and said, oh, we have this application we want to deploy um, and we need a server for it, I would have to, you know, we have to provision hard, have to buy some hardware. Um, assemble it and take it down to the data center. And so it was a lot of work to do. And then um, I discovered VMware and we installed it in our, um, our off office data center where we had kind of all of our development environments and non-production things. And it was great. So somebody came and said, can I have a server? And yeah, sure, I can cut your VM. VM for you, VM for you. You know, anybody who wants a VM, I can just do it like that, snap of a finger. And so that felt really awesome. Like, you know, Mickey Mouse in the, the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice um, where he's got his, you know, magical brooms that are just doing all the work for him, and it was, it was awesome. And then this, what happened to Mickey is the same thing that happened to me. I ended up with loads and loads of virtual machines, which were out of control. They were all different versions of things. I couldn't keep them all patched and up to date. Uh, it was just a big mess. Um, so part of what happens is this thing of configuration drift. And the idea of configuration drift is that even if you start with servers that are identical, so you create a couple of servers, you create them from the same original image, or you copy an existing server that's running and has everything installed. It's very convenient. Um, over time, they become more and more different because you go into, you have a problem on one server, and so you go and fix it, and now that server's different from the others. Or you have, um, this application needs a, maybe a different version of Java installed, and so you go and you, you update that. Or, you know, whatever it is, things kind of over time get all out of, out of whack. And we would like to think that um, configuration automation tools, things like Ansible and Puppet and Chef, um, these will help us manage that. But what happens in, in practice is that we're, we're not able to kind of use these comfortably across all of our things. 
So what will happen is, and let's let's say we have an application. Most of our applications are running on Java 7. Um, we have a new application that needs uh, Java 8. But our existing applications, some of them don't work with Java 8 yet. We're going to need to do work for that. So we go into one sort okay, we, we, we have our Ansible script that installs the JDK on machines. Um, and so what we do is we tweak it to install Java 8, and we point it at that machine that needs Java 8, and it runs against that. Now we can't run this automation script against all of our servers. We have to kind of edit it or, or you know, kind of manage these different versions of the code for different servers. And so we kind of lose confidence because what will happen is people will do something like that, and then they'll, or things will change, like somebody will go and patch a server, for instance, or make a manual change. And then when you run the configuration tool, it breaks on some servers and not on others. And so you say, ah, well, I need to go and do a manual thing then to get this. I have something I have to do right now, and the automation is, is you know, kind of broken. Um, and so I'll go and do it manually. And that kind of increases that, that drift and the, the difference between um, servers. So you kind of, you just don't have the trust to, to run the tool. And so you kind of, you don't get the full value out of the automation compared with, um, uh, you know, what the promise of those tools is. So one of the, the things that we need to do in order to avoid this um, or to manage this is to run automation continuously. So the, the way that most of these tools are designed to work is not that you run it from the command line and say, I want to make a change, and so I'm going to edit my um, playbooks, then run Ansible. Um, the way they're, they're meant to be run is on a continuous, like as an as agent that just runs all the time and keeps reapplying the configuration. And so what this means is you have to be disciplined about it. So if you have those two different versions of Java that you want to run, you're going to have to say, okay, I'm going to have two playbooks, actually two roles or whatever it may be, two um, cookbooks or a parameter to those cookbooks, which says these servers have Java 7, these have Java 8. And so the automation can run against all of those. Um, and whenever something does break, you go and you fix it. It's like the continuous integration or whatever. When something breaks, you go and immediately fix it so that the, the configuration can continuously run and you can kind of keep that level of confidence. The other kind of strategy for this is the kind of immutable servers pattern. How many people are familiar with immutable servers or immutable infrastructure? How many have heard that term? So um, a few have. So the idea of this one is um, rather than saying we want to make a configuration change, we've got a server that's running and we need to make a configuration change. Maybe we just want to patch it. Maybe we want to tweak a configuration setting or whatever it may be, um, add a new thing. Rather than changing it on the running server, um, we build a new server uh, with the change on it. And then we can kind of test it, make sure it's okay, and then redirect traffic or, or whatever service you know, is provided by that server to the new server. And then um, once we're comfortable with that's worked, you can kind of tear down the old server. Uh, but the point is to kind of do this frequently, that you don't have servers that live for very long. Um, and so, again, you're, you're, you're confident that everything is, is managed and defined by your tools. Because one of the things that's, that's difficult with automation, and we've seen this um, with automated deployments, and with automated testing um, is that doing large batches of change at once is difficult. So with automated testing, the, the, the pattern that um, we often see is where you have a testing team that has the automation tool, right? And it's a UI based thing. And so whenever the developers you know, finish a batch, whether it's a release or an iteration or whatever, um, then they hand it over to the testing team and the testing team runs the, the, the test scripts, you know, the regression suite, and they break. And they don't just break because developers, you know, there's bugs. They, usually they break because the developers have changed the code in some way, which means the tests need to be updated to reflect that. And so what happens is the longer the period is between um, releases of software from development to testing, um, the more work it takes just to get that test suite up to date to where it's actually telling you whether something is broken versus things have been changed. And so, you know, when you've got long periods, like this, it's, this tends to kind of not work very well and kind of people kind of give up. You have the automation effort. You, you, you you know, you have this point where you invest a lot of energy and effort into updating the regression test suite, and it works. Um, and then the next time around, you don't have time to update it, and so it just gets kind of abandoned or, or, or run. Um, so we've seen this with the test automation, and this is similar with infrastructure automation. Um, rather than um, saying, we're going to go, you know, we have a cloud now. We're going to use AWS. We're going to go to the console and set up a whole bunch of servers and figure it out, and then automate all the things that we figured out. You kind of need to kind of make your changes bit by bit, but with the automation. Right, so each kind of change that you make, you, you, you start with the tool, with the automation tool, and make it there and run it and see how it works, um, and then do the next change and the next change. And this means that rather than automation being something you're trying to kind of retrofit, um, it's something that you do as you go along, it becomes your habit. And it's something that can take a while to get to grips with and get comfortable with, but once you get comfortable with it, it's kind of hard to go back, right? So when I um, started working uh, with a team, a few months ago that was working with Azure, Microsoft's cloud, 
Um, I wasn't familiar with that platform, but I found it actually easier um, to learn by by using the you know the automation tools, the um, uh, resource management uh, templates, and these kind of things, um, and using the GUIs as something to look at, but not as a way to kind of uh, manage infrastructure. Um, so this I, I haven't it defined. So I've been talking about infrastructure as code. Um, the definition I give for this is basically using tools and practices from software engineering, and particularly agile software engineering, um, and applying those to our infrastructure. All right, and so this is this is kind of how I how I use the phrase. So the kind of um, very basic thing we do that is we define our environments and things about our environments and our systems as code. And so what this means is uh, we can reuse stuff, right? So once we have a definition of this is what an application server looks like. We don't need to um, kind of redo it for a bit. We can just reuse the same code for, for multiple application servers. And so this is where when you have, for example, an operations department uh, or an infrastructure team, they have to request, can you create a server for me? And it takes, you know, it might take a couple of weeks because they have to go and configure it to spec. You have this kind of standard server that you just go, okay, yeah, fine, we can do it. Actually, you can do it yourself. We'll give you a button or a script um, that's been well proven and we've used it for other application servers and you just run it and you've got, you know, you've got your, yourself one. So it's reusable and it's consistent because you know every server, every application server you have is created with this automation and they're all consistent. And even if there's some variation in how they need to be configured, again, Java versions maybe or Tomcat versions or whatever it may, whatever it may be, um, that's still within the automation, right? So all of our Tomcat 7 servers are, you know, the, the, you know, the same um, to the, and consistent in the ways that they need to be. It's also visible in that anybody who needs to understand how things are configured, rather than having to log on to servers and see what's going on, they can just look at the, the code. Um, and this applies to kind of security folks and auditors and, and architects and anybody who has kind of like governance responsibilities and wants to make sure you know, our team's doing things correctly, they can look at the code to see how it actually how it actually is, rather than going to look at documentation and diagrams, for example, which are probably out of date. Um, obviously, you can put it into version control, so you can go and see the history of changes that have been made to it. And it's actionable. So what, what I mean by actionable is if things are defined as code and you stick them into a version control system, every time somebody commits a change, you can trigger some kind of action. So you can see that a change has been made. Uh, you can do things like continuous integration, as I'll get on to. So the prerequisite to being able to do this kind of stuff is what I call a dynamic infrastructure platform. This is basically where you have a bunch of an API that lets you manage um, compute resources, network resources, you know, storage, and so on. Um, and I use this term as kind of like, so it's cloud infrastructure as a service is the obvious thing that we're, we're talking about. Um, but the reason I use the, the term dynamic platform Instead, is because it doesn't have to be a cloud. It doesn't have to be a, um, an IaaS type cloud. You can do it with virtualization. So with um, even VMware, even the non-V cloud uh, VMware, you can have scripts and stuff that make it work this way. And even with physical infrastructure, you can make it dynamic by using tools like Foreman or what have you to automatically boot hardware and install operating system images on them. So if you need to work at the hardware level for your particular system, you can still have this kind of automation happening. It takes more work. It's obviously very easy to do it with the cloud. That's kind of the ideal and, and lowest um, barriers to doing it. But it is possible to do it in various types of infrastructure, as well as with platform as a service, containers, serverless, all of these things, they, they, they apply whatever it is that you're kind of managing, whatever the, the, the platform it is that you're deploying onto. So um, thinking about the different parts, the different kind of tooling that's involved in this, the kind of high-level thing is this, um, environment definitions or environment provisioning stuff. So this is things like Terraform or CloudFormation. Uh, you know, each of the clouds has their own kind of things. They've got Ansible cloud modules, and there are other tools that do this. But the, the point is that um, it's something which you point at a cloud or your dynamic platform um, and, and say, you know, I want these servers, I want these networking rules put in place, I want this storage created and provisioned and attached. Um, and so it kind of works at that level, and so you can kind of define an environment instance. And so there's this idea of the stack. This is a useful thing that I'm going to use for kind of some of the, the further things I'm going to talk about. So um, AWS's CloudFormation tool uses the term stack. Other tools don't use the same term, um, but I use it because it's just an easy way to get your head around. And what the point is is that you've got this project, which might be some CloudFormation templates, including things that import stuff, or it might be a Terraform project. But the point of a stack is that it's a kind of a collection of elements that are all managed as a group. So with Terraform, how many people here use Terraform and are familiar with the concept of state files? <laughs> Um, a few, but not many. So um, the point is when you make a change to your, your you get this project of, that defines an environment and the things in it. Um, and when you run Terraform, it um, creates a state file which says, 
you know, here's the stuff that's managed out in the cloud, and, and um, Terraform kind of uses that to understand when you make a change to your code and you run it again, it says, okay, what are the things that are different and, and which parts of the actual infrastructure am I managing? So that, like, if you have an, uh, you know, you create a server, but you happen to have other servers that are created, you know, independently of your tool, Terraform doesn't say, well, that's supposed to be my server and I'll do things to it, right? It knows what things it belongs to. And CloudFormation and AWS, um, although it doesn't have that explicit state file, it still has that same concept of there is a stack of things, and when you change your, the code for that, um, it knows, it kind of hides that for you and manages that for you behind the scenes. Um, so um, the reason um, ta uh, the, the stack is useful is when you think about having multiple environments, so we want a staging environment, we want a production environment, the first thing that people tend to do with a tool like Terraform or CloudFormation is to say, I'm going to make my project and I'm going to have, I'm going to find in here my staging stuff and my production stuff, and it's all in the same project, and it's all in the same stack. So what happens is, and the reason I put the unhappy face here is what happens is um, there's a concept of, of blast radius, and Charity Majors is a, um, a, a blogger and, and, and runs a company, um, Honeycomb, I hope, um, I think kind of popularized that, that term for this, this domain. Um, and the idea is that when you go to your, and say, I want to make a, a change to my staging environment, and obviously I want to test it there before I put it into my production environment, you change the code there, you might accidentally break something in production because it's part of the same stack. Um, and so you change this little bit of code, and you might not realize that there's actually an impact on, on this code, that something is shared between them or whatever, or the name you know, is a conflict. Um, and so it's very easy to break something in production when you don't think that you're actually making a change to production. And so kind of the next um, step, or the, a, a better pattern for this, is to make separate projects. And say, okay, here's my code for the staging environment. Here's my code for the production environment. If I want another environment, I just copy the code into another project. And each one has their own stack. They have their own state file in Terraform or in CloudFormation. They're their own stack, literal stack, in, in, or sorry, in, in CloudFormation. Um, and then the idea is that you can make your changes to staging and apply it, and you're pretty confident you're not going to break something in production. And once you're happy with it, you copy those that code change into your production environment. Um, and the face here is a little bit happier or less unhappy, let's say, um, because one of the reasons why we like to use infrastructure as code is we want to get away from this um, issue of environments being inconsistent, right? Because we go and we make a change to staging. We say, well, I want to make this change. And you change the code there, and it's not quite right. You're not ready to change it in production. Somebody else comes along and makes changes in staging. Uh, or they fix something in production, and so you get kind of these differences, which means something that works in staging doesn't work in production, and you get surprised. So we want to use our infrastructure as, as code um, to make sure that you know we're really confident there's, that the only differences between these two are maybe things that are deliberate differences, like maybe the number of servers in a pool or the you know memory size which we've assigned to things might be different, um, but those are controlled things. Um, and so this, even though this is using infrastructure as code, it's still you can still end up with that kind of mess where the, you know, you're copying code between environments and you forget to change a, a name, you should forget the, to change the, you know, the, the label of staging um, to production when you copy it over here, whatever it may be, it, it kind of leaves um, some room for error. So it's fairly simple to do if you have a fairly small environment with like it's just a couple of people managing it, it might be, you know, this, this can be all right because um, it's fairly simple. Um, but what I tend to recommend is basically treating it like we treat a, an application artifact like a Java war file or whatever, this idea that what we'll do is we'll have a single project um, and we just, when we run Terraform or what have you, uh, we, we create a separate stack for each, but we pass parameters to it um, with a different name. Um, and so this means we've got a single file um, you know, that works for each. We can make changes to the file and apply it to our development environment then test that. And then once we're happy, then we run the, the, the command again, but tell it to apply to the staging environment, apply to the production environment. And this gives us consistency and also the control across these. And what this also lets us do is to do kind of automated testing. So the, the kind of workflow for this is as somebody who's working on this code as a kind of a developer, infrastructure developer, um, I can work on my local machine. Um, I can make changes to my code. and I've got my own instance of my stack that nobody else looks at. Nobody else cares what damage I do to it. So I can mess around with the code, apply it, apply it, and then uh, I get comfortable with that it's working. And then I can commit it. I can push it to a source code repository, and then I can have a CI server, um, which will automatically trigger, and this is where I was talking about actionable before, right? So it automatically triggers now, and the CI server runs Terraform um, with the code that I've pushed, 
it creates its own stack, its own instance of the environment, and can run some automated tests against it um, and make sure it's happy. And then it can tear it down afterwards and promote and promote it along so we can have a pipeline that says, uh, you know, the, 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 the code that we're applying to production is applied by our continuous delivery server, so something like GoCD or Concourse or Jenkins or whatever it may be, um, is actually running Terraform. And so that becomes, it's not somebody running it from their laptop and making changes to production. You know, it's the server is doing it with scripts that are all versioned themselves and are managed so that we, we, you know, we know what's being done in a consistent way. And we know what's being done in exactly the same way that it was in our test environments um, so that we have a very high level of confidence in what those changes are. And we can also obviously introduce manual kind of steps to, to push a change along. So if you're a little bit worried about what might happen in production, you can have a stage where like so a QA stage where a, a person manually looks over the environment um, you know, has an environment that they, they can test against. They look it over and then push the button to say, yes, this is good to go to production. And then and then it gets um, deployed to production. So just like with source, this was like, you know, um, software continuous delivery. It's exactly the same concepts, but we're using it for our infrastructure code. And now we start thinking about some of the more complex patterns of, of pipelines. So I've been showing these very simplified things of just a couple of stages. Um, and so what we can do here is we can say we've got our application code. Let's say it's a Java application. We're building a, maybe it's a Spring Boot or Drop Wizard application. It builds a jar file. So we have our CI stage, the app build stage. It's a CI, continuous integration for our application code. Runs the unit tests. If it's happy, it creates that jar file and puts it in a repository. And then similarly for our, our environment that we want to deploy that onto, uh, we have an infrastructure. We have, like I say, a Terraform project. Um, again, we do as I described, we work on it, we push the, that thing to source control in our CI stage for the infrastructure runs and test the infrastructure. And then only when, you know, a change to either one of these has passed, um, we run this stage which says, great, now I'm going to create an environment or make changes to an existing test environment and deploy the application onto it and run the tests, like the journey tests or whatever it may be, to make sure that it all hangs together and works correctly. And so this is something I've done. I used to do it more where I would apply the infrastructure like chef cookbooks or whatever directly onto the environment. But then I would break things because I messed up a cookbook, um, which would mess up the servers, which meant that the development teams couldn't kind of work. They had to wait for me to fix my problem. I mean, given that I was working with infrastructure, that problem that could be quite big. Um, so I, I got to this thing of having an infrastructure test the infrastructure first. And only once that is passed and looks good, do I pass it along and, and pretend, you know, it, avoid breaking development process. And then these things move, so the infrastructure code and the application code move together throughout all the environments and we know the environments are consistent and we've tested, you know, it's, you know, once it gets to production, we know we've tested this version of the application with this version of the infrastructure and so we're very confident. And so going down to the next level of tooling, so I've been talking about that kind of environment level stuff, the cloud formation, Terraform. And I'm now looking at what happens with servers. So part of what's in those definitions is it says, um, you know, I want an application server and a web server and a database server, for instance. Um, and so then it, it, it doesn't manage what goes onto those servers. It just kind of says create that kind of server. And so we need a tool to kind of manage that. Um, and this is where we've got tools like Ansible, Chef Puppet, which um, manage what goes on inside a server. So what packages get installed, what user accounts get created, um, what configuration files are in place, and, and what's in them. Um, and so the way this kind of process works is you have like a base server image, like an AMI or a VMware template or whatever it may be, um, and that gets spun up, and then the configuration tool runs and, and does things to it, right? And now you've got your running server, and that's cool. Um, and so then in terms of pipelines to manage this stuff, this is where we kind of break things down. And so if we look at like server roles, where they say like here we have a web server and an application server, when we have, an, as let's say, Ansible playbooks and roles that kind of configure what goes on to those things, you can have test stages for that. Um, so rather than having to, because what happens with that, when we're using Terraform or CloudFormation to spin up a whole bunch of infrastructures, that kind of takes a while, right? So the, the feedback cycle is a bit long um, to wait for the, those automated you know, continuous integration tests at that level. So we can say before we get to that even, before we get to that infrastructure test stage, I'll just my little pointer there, before we get to that stage, we're going to say, let's do some continuous integration testing on just our server configuration code. And so we might use um, like a virtual machine or we might use, um, uh, so uh, on, on a few projects now we've used Docker images where we, we basically spin up a Docker image that has a Linux on it. Um, and then it runs our Ansible playbooks or our cookbooks or whatever it may be. And then it runs some tests, some automated tests using something like server spec 
And we can use a, test, uh, a tool called Test Kitchen, which is quite good for managing these, spin up some infrastructure, apply some things to it, and then run these automated tests and kind of manage that process. And so this is kind of, we can get faster feedback on whether uh, we've got our server level configuration stuff correct. And if it's correct, then we can pass it along and say, okay, now use Terraform or whatever to spin up, um, you know, an actual virtual machines um, on our infrastructure with the networking around it and run some tests that look at that level. Does everything still kind of talk to each other um, up at that level? Now, the next thing we can do is I, I talked about um, previously where we have that base AMI that we use and we spin up our server image and then we run Ansible or what have you. Um, actually, we can go and we can start kind of building stuff onto the server image. Let's say we have an application server. We need to install a JDK. We need to install a Tomcat. Those are very heavyweight things. Every time you spin up a new server in any environment, having to run your Ansible playbooks to, to install those things, it takes a while. And there is also some element of risk. So even if you're, you're, or you're that you'll break something, right? So even if um, you're running the, the, the Ansible playbook to install Java and you've tested it in, a, in an upstream environment, when you run it in production, um, it might, for example, bring in some dependencies, some, some um, uh, you know, you have your explicit dependency. I want to install the JDK, but the JDK package says it has some dependencies which also get installed. And maybe one of the versions of those has changed. And so then it breaks something or something is different in production than what was in your test environment. So you can say instead, let's put it onto the AMI or the, the, the VMware template or even a physical kind of server um, image that we use. Um, and then now every time we spin up a new server um, instance, um, we, you know, everything's already installed. And this also helps with things like auto scaling um, because if you're using auto scaling to bring up new servers automatically, you want that to happen quickly. You don't want to have to wait several minutes for all these, these configuration things to be done to the server. Um, yeah, so Packer is kind of the pretty much the only tool the only, um, that, that does this. It's certainly, it's, it's by far the most popular. Um, and what it does is it, um, you have like a, some uh, a server image definition. So Packer is a Packer template, it's a JSON file. You define what's the base server image. This is probably like an OS installation image or a stock image from, you know, with Amazon's AMI kind of library. So it says, you know, spin up um, a server with that and then run some things, and that, that can be things like your Ansible and your cookbooks or whatever it is, or it can be shell scripts. It runs those things on this kind of um, temporary server image. You can kind of do some tests to make sure it's okay, and then you turn that into a new AMI, and then you can kind of run tests on that. You can actually have a pipeline for that. So what we do here is we say, we've got a server image pipeline um, for our application server AMI. Um, and that runs Packer to build, the, to build a new AMI, with a version, so you version these things so that you can kind of have, you know, um, changes to it that are versioned and tracked across time. Um, and then you can like say, now what we'll do is we'll spin up uh, a server image from that new AMI version, run automated tests on that. Um, so here, this is showing um, here where we've got essentially like our playbooks or whatever that install Java and uh, Tomcat onto the server. And then we actually spin up a new, uh, a new um, once we've created the AMI at this point, we spin up a new server, we run the tests and make sure it's happy before we then pass that on and say run our infra test stage as we said earlier. Maybe we still have some, some extra cookbooks that have to run on that to do some runtime configuration. Um, but the, the, the point is that we're kind of testing everything incrementally um, and bringing it together. So now, the, one of the big challenges that come up when we talk about things like using pipelines for infrastructure and defining our environment as a template that things get quite big. So if our production environment looks like this, um, having a single stack, having this, uh, you know, a, a, a Terraform project which defines all of that stuff and then creates it and manages it in one big stack, even though we have our staging and development environments that are identical but separate, um, you know, it's quite messy. So it takes a long time to test. And so one of the barriers to doing those automated testing in the pipeline that I talked about is, you know, it takes you know, um, 60 minutes to spin up all the servers and everything that, that represent our whole production environment. Um, and, you know, it's a very kind of fragile and difficult process and, and it becomes, you know, it's unwieldy. You can't really do that. And so this is coming back to the definition of a stack as a whole thing. So the solution to this, to make this more tenable and more workable is, um, uh, yeah, and the other thing is just that you can break things within that stack. You know, you have multiple teams working on this stack. So we might be changing something which might have an impact on somebody over there. And so we end up with having to have a lot of coordination overhead between the teams working on our, our environment. So what we want to do instead is break 
it down into multiple stacks. Um, and this starts looking familiar. So if you're, you know, and, and from the software architecture world, this is like we've got a monolith and we need to break it down into microservices, right? It just happens to be infrastructure. Um, and so that we could, we want to be able to change each of those things independently. And yes, there'll be integration between them. So this kind of thing over here, um, might, um, have, you know, uh, might integrate with an application running over in this stack or the infrastructure might integrate in some ways. Um, but the boundaries become more clear. Okay. Um, so we've got, um, you know, it becomes more visible what the dependencies are between these stacks and we can ma manage those the same way that we manage dependencies between applications. Um, and we, we can define those boundaries to minimize changes that go across those stacks. And so again, similar to infrastructure um, or to applications, um, you know, what you, so as an example, the, a, a typical boundary in the infrastructure world is between those kind of tiers of we've got our web servers that are running with a firewall in front of them, and then our application servers are in a, a separate subnet or VLAN, so a firewall in between them, and then our database servers in another one. And so this is kind of some natural boundaries from the way that we structure our networks. But it turns out that's not great boundaries for managing infrastructure definitions. Um, so that's useful because from a security point of view, you want to make sure if somebody breaks into our web tier because that's what's public facing, and you can kind of connect to a port straight into that or through a firewall into that, if somebody can compromise that, you want to make it harder for them to jump down to your application servers and then jump down to your, your database servers. Um, but when you make a change you're off to an application or to a system, you're often having to change things. We're making a change to our, our uh, web server um, configuration and our application and maybe database. Um, and so that the, if you um, draw your boundaries for your infrastructure that way, that means we have to change three different stacks at once to make a single to implement a single change, you know, a feature or whatever, a feature change. Um, and so then you've got to coordinate between those and worry about what order things run in. And so instead, what you want to do is draw the boundaries so that you look at your typical patterns of change in your organization um, and figure out what boundaries make sense. And this often also falls in with Conway's law and this idea that your organization structure will kind of align with or needs to align with your application um, infrastructure, your system infrastructure or uh, architecture. And so you kind of need to think about all these things. What are our team structures? What's our desired system architecture? Um, and, and then the, the infrastructure needs to kind of map to that. And so you can still implement those physical boundaries. So even though we've got this, these infrastructure changes, which, which control web servers and application servers and database servers for one application, say one microservice maybe, are all you know, the infrastructure for that microservices in one stack. We can manage those together, um, but we can still have the, the, the network boundaries in there from that security point of view. So it's not like we have to, you know, those, those are two different concerns which kind of map different ways. It's important. And then for each of these stacks, it has its own pipeline, which manages the changes to that stack. And so the team that's working on that can kind of push their changes through and test it, and even test integration in other environments with other stacks for other applications. And so you can, you can have that going on. Um, and so in terms of sharing components, the way it looks is we've got three different application stacks, each of which deploys, or micro, let's say they're microservices, right? They deploy into the production environment, but they share like the AMI. So they all use that kind of Tomcat application server AMI built with Packer there. Um, and this starts to help with the, the kind of um, those issues that we have around sharing code and versioning and all of that. So if somebody makes a change to this, to the, to the, the Tomcat server, because you know, my team needs a, a, you know, a, a tweak to the, the, the way Tomcat is installed, um, that will get fed into a pipeline. And if the tests here pass, then we know it's good and we, we can push it on through to production for other, other applications too. Um, but if it breaks, we can kind of stop it. And so maybe the, the first application still pushes its change through to production, but now we can have this conversation around, okay, what do we need to do to make sure that, um, you know, our application you know, is going to work? You know, which things do we need to change um, in order to make that, that work for everybody? And then another pattern for sharing things across is where actually you have things that are shared um, but deployed separately. So in some cases, things, uh, you know, networking constructs, things like subnets and VPCs and so on, if you're familiar with these, um, it's useful to set up like one instance of that and then have different applications deploying into that. Um, and so you can have a separate pipeline where we make changes to our network infrastructure, shared infrastructure. We can push that through its own pipeline and into production um, independently of pushing things through, applications through. And this is to try to reduce the coupling. Um, and as with applications where you do that microservices deployment patterns where you're not testing necessarily everything together, you're pushing into production. 
Um, you need certain levels of maturity. So things like um, integration, you know, how do it, you know, you might have like um, consumer driven contract testing where we say in our pipeline here, we're going to test things that they're things that we're going to run tests that these people have given us to make sure that we're not breaking something they rely on. Um, you also need kind of monitoring and you, you need kind of release patterns. So blue green deployments, canary releasing and all those can come into play and be useful to make this work and to give teams independence, but still have confidence that you're not likely to break something. Uh, so how do we know that we've, we've, we've got this working well? So um, basically, if you can make changes to your infrastructure or to your systems in general easily and routinely without it being a big trauma or a big you know, project that we need to kind of stop everything and, and, and you know, coordinate, um, you know, that's what you're after, right? Um, and teams shouldn't be spending time waiting for approvals or resources, right? So if I, we need to create a new um, service and we need to create a development environment for that, we should just be able to kind of do it, right? If we get these kind of pieces in place, it should make it, um, everybody should be relaxed about that and not worried about, oh, we can't let the development team create a development environment um, because instead they're going to use the same code that runs through pipelines and is using the standard, you know, again, application server images or whatever, and any things that they need to do that are unique, we're going to kind of put through all of that that process. So it's all managed and comfortable, but also self-service. So just these are a, a number of books um, that I found useful. Some of them influenced um, um, what I've talked about today, and, and some of them are things that I think can be useful. So um, particularly around things like databases. So, so I've got asked about databases, and I haven't managed to kind of fit into the talk to talk about how we handle that kind of stuff. Um, but um, there's a, a fairly recent book out on database reliability engineering, which talks about DevOps and databases and, and continuous delivery and all that, how it all fits together. Um, and yeah, there's a number of other books here which are probably familiar to people. So um, I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, well, yeah, about the three minutes, I guess, or so. Um, so if anybody's got a question or two, um, okay. Server configuration tools, yep. Um, more, which one will be more uh, seamless? Okay. So Should I repeat my question or uh, you got uh, it? I'll, I'll, I'll kind of summarize if I can. And that might help also to make sure that I'm, I'm getting it. So in terms of those various tools, we've got various levels of tools um, that I talked about. And so where do they kind of fit in together? And so very, very roughly, um, I talk about um, infrastructure uh, or environment provisioning tools or environment definition tools. This is Terraform, CloudFormation, and so on. And these are things which can say spin up servers and networking. And, you know, they basically talk to the cloud platform directly. Um, and so kind of a question off of that then was, so um, in terms of if you know what cloud providers you're using, which tools are appropriate. So essentially each of these cloud platforms tends to have their own tools. So you've got um, AWS has CloudFormation, um, uh, Azure has ARM, Google has their um, deployment manager. Um, and so they, they each have their own kind of specific tool. And so, um, and then there's also Terraform, which works across them. And Ansible can also do this kind of thing. And, and you know, Chef has tools, Puppet has tools. Um, so I tend to find that, like, what I would tend to go for is if we're fairly confident in the, that we're going to just use this one cloud platform, um, it might be a good idea to use that tool. It tends to be kind of the most, you know, well-supported and so on, um, although that's not a 100% recommendation. Terraform tends to be my default because it works across. It doesn't work across in a um, completely independent way, so you can't basically define what a server looks like with Terraform code and then run it on any cloud and it will work, right? You have to define it separately. So Terraform is kind of a thin abstraction layer. So what it gives you is if you're working across multiple cloud providers, um, yeah, okay, you can't write code once and run it on all of them, but you can say the tool is the same and the way it works is the same, so I don't have to use two different tools for that same function. And that can be quite nice and useful. And also its syntax is quite nice. It's open source, unlike most of the tools from the cloud providers. So you can kind of um, get in there more deeply. Um, for some of the other platforms, so other than, so Terraform has great AWS support, um, its support for the other platforms is, is not as great. So I would kind of explore, I wouldn't commit to any, any tool before exploring and, and getting used to it and understanding the, the limitations. So that would be my recommendation is not to get tied into a tool too quickly.
So one last question. Uh, sorry, I had a question up here. Uh, Okay. So the question is, can you justify um, investing in a pipeline for infrastructure code if it doesn't change that frequently? Um, so I would say, if your infrastructure doesn't change very frequently, that's you know you you, you may not need to make that investment. Um, I think that's fairly rare these days, especially if you're using um, kind of cloud platforms. So like you give the example of Linux code. So if you're only updating your Linux servers once a year, I think you're 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 very dangerous from a security point of view. You need to be doing you know patching and those kind of things very frequently. And pipelines actually help with that. Um, so if you have a pipeline that rolls out changes, so I, I normally patch my servers you know at least weekly, if not every day, um, and I can do that with the pipeline. Whereas if I'm using manual processes, I can't, um, and I can test you know while I'm doing that. Um, so I would say in, in most environments that I've worked on, especially in cloud, things are changing so rapidly um, that it's, it's, for me, it's difficult to, to justify not, <laughs> not automating it. And also from a security point of view and compliance, if that's a concern, these are, are really useful tools for that, or really important patterns. So I guess that's it. Um, thanks a lot for coming out. <laughs>